Amen. You know, I remember growing up, my grandfather used to say, it's great to be alive. You know, it's awesome when we sing that song, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Wow. It's great to be alive. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father God, we are so thankful that because you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to this earth, because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he gave of himself, not considering equality with God, something to be grasped. He gave up himself for the sake of us. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Lord God, I pray right now for each person. I pray whatever they're, they're struggling with, whatever circumstance they found themselves in within these last couple days, weeks, months, Lord God, I pray that you will encourage them, that you will strengthen them, that you will reassure them that because you live, we can face tomorrow. Father, I pray for those who are in need of healing today. I pray for those who need healing physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, Lord God. Will you meet them where they are? Your word says that by his stripes we are healed. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. God, may you bring peace into our lives, into our hearts today. We love you and we thank you. Now, Lord, as we come to your word, as we come to your truth, may my words not be of eloquence or or a demonstration of man's wisdom, but a demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power. And may we leave today changed. Father, may you make us by the power of your Holy Spirit more into the likeness of your son, Jesus. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Woo! Well, I'm excited. We, we have reached the final week of our current series from trauma to triumph. And I, I pray that throughout these last few weeks, God has impressed one of these phrases upon your heart and life. Maybe God is challenging you to rely more on Him and less on yourself. Maybe He has instilled within you a greater confidence to live life to the fullest through His goodness and grace. It could be that, that you've been awakened by being more aware of your circumstances and the traumatic moments in your life and the decisions and choices that you make will be to the glory of God. You know, something that's really fascinating is that when David was in battle, it says that he, before he went up to fight the battle, he inquired of the Lord. I pray that that's something that each one of us do when we're met with a situation or a circumstance that's out of our control, that that we would inquire of the Lord first. Whatever the case and and whatever the reason, throughout these last few weeks, the, the most important thing that I pray for is that this has driven you these moments, these these sermons have driven you further and further into the arms of Jesus. The simplicity of an embrace. I was, thinking, I was talking to a, a friend last week who's a hugger, and he said, you know, I can't wait until we go green so that I can hug you, Pastor Lamech. <laughs> can you imagine those miracle moments when Jesus healed someone? He, he restored their sight, cleansed the lepers, 
He exercised demons and and paralytics who gained the use of their extremities. I'm sure an embrace is what they had longed for and what they received from Jesus. I officiated a wedding last week and I, I couldn't help but think of two main moments in that wedding ceremony. The first was when I asked, who gives this woman to be married to this man? And usually the father says, her mother and me. And what happens next is a tearjerker. I love yous are exchanged between father and daughter. And right then and there, in that moment, one of the most intimate hugs between father and daughter takes place. And then near the end of the ceremony, the groom and bride stand together and I announce them that they are husband and wife and it gets to that awkward moment where where the groom smiles because he knows what's coming, the kiss. (laughs) But not just the kiss, think about it, not just the kiss, but the very first intimate embrace of the newlywed couple. Nothing is as pure and as genuine as that hug. Ecclesiastes 3.5 says, There is a time for everything, a time to embrace. So why do I bring up hugs? Why do I bring up moments of embrace? Because in the midst of circumstances, in the midst of traumatic moments, sometimes the best action that we can take for somebody else is by embracing them, giving them a hug. At times, please listen, at times people don't need advice, opinions, what I would do. They don't desire words, they desire your presence. I've said this before, the best action that the three friends of Job took was sitting silently with Job for the first seven days. No one said a word for seven days straight, but they were among him. They were present. Let me ask you, can you think of someone who may be in this situation right now. Someone who is looking for your presence rather than your preference. Someone who is looking for your company rather than your comment. I pray that God will use each one of us in those moments where people need our presence more than anything else. And I hope that our faith in God will direct and point them to him. So with that being said, please turn with me into your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 4, 9b. 2 Corinthians 4, 9b. And as you're turning there, I just want to briefly summarize the phrases so far. First, we saw in the first week, we are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Like in the heat of battle, our lives are bombarded or surrounded by troubles and sorrow. But, it says, we are not demoralized. We are not overwhelmed to the point of giving in or giving up because we look to God for our hope and strength. We are, we are perplexed. It says next, but not in despair. There are moments of confusion and bewilderment and uncertainty. I mean, we're, we've been living in that moment for the last two or three months now. But, but we're never, here's the beautiful thing, we're never left in misery or hopelessness because of the assurance and the hope that we find in Jesus Christ. Third was, we are persecuted but not abandoned. We talked last week about how Paul told Timothy, in fact, get this, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Persecuted. And Jesus, he knew all about persecution and abandonment, but he told his followers, us included, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I mean, hallelujah, isn't that great news that Jesus promises his presence with us until the end of the age? 
we are not abandoned. Now, if you think about it, every one of these realities so far have become more and more drastic each week. It starts out by being pressed on every side and, and being perplexed, and those are our mental states that we find ourselves in. It's, it's so much so that it's, it's a more of a natural, passive situation. It's not being done to them physically. Rather, it's a battle of intellect and will. But when we come to this final reality, even in the third reality, we are persecuted. But in this final reality, harm or trauma has come their way physically. One of the games uh, growing up that I used to play, which they actually started coming out with, I think we bought it for my son one year, but but it's called Rock'em Sock'em Robots. And there's this intentionality to this game. What you're trying to do is you're, you're pushing these buttons that control the arms of the robots, and what the robot is doing, you're trying to angle it to a point where it punches the opponent over and over enough times in the chin that it head, its head pops up, which indicates defeat. So we've come to the final reality and hope. Paul writes, struck down, but not destroyed. Struck down, but not destroyed. Let's look at the reality. Struck down. Troubles, perplexity, persecution, and now the act of being struck down, Paul says. I mean, it it's, doesn't get more drastic than this. This is the end all to end all, it would seem. This, the straw that broke the camel's back. The last straw. Enough is enough. The I can't take it anymore. I imagine this, this slow motion battle where the soldier is being struck to the point of being beaten down. Or like an athlete, as if a boxer is, is sparring and, and overhand right to a left jab, to a right jab, and then to an uppercut. He's struck to the ground and the referee begins to count you know after the oppression of God's people in Egypt God sends ten plagues as he uses Moses to warn Pharaoh and each plague represents one of the Egyptian gods in the first nine they're an inconvenience and there's a lot of of things happening in the first nine plagues, but the tenth plague is the end all of end all. The tenth is the most devastating. Moses tells Pharaoh and his leaders, this is what the Lord says. About midnight I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die, from the firstborn son of Pharaoh who sits on the throne to the firstborn son of the slave girl who is at her handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle as well. There will be loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there has ever been or ever will be again. And we read in Exodus 12, 29 through 30, the reality is happening. It says, at midnight the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the prisoner who was in the dungeon and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all of his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night and there was loud wailing in Egypt for there was not a house without someone dead. You know, as I read this, the first four words jump out at me. I, I keep reading this phrase over and over, the Lord struck down. Struck down, for there was not a house without someone dead. I mean, the severity of the situation is that the penalty was death of the firstborn for the mistreatment of God's people. I mean, can you imagine the reality of this all, all of this? Them waking up to find the firstborn dead? I mean, what misery, what suffering, what hopelessness. And, and yet, at the same time, this is a significant point in the history of Israel. The Passover festival was 
to commemorate the protection and provision of God's people during this time. You see, because during this time, the Israelites were told to make sacrifices to the Lord and take the blood and smear it on the doorposts and sides with hyssop. And it says this, when the Lord goes through the land to strike down the pass over... um, when the Lord strike, goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and sides of the doorframe and will pass over that doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. See, God's grace is evident and can be clearly seen even through this traumatic moment. Last week I mentioned God meeting Moses at the burning bush and God indeed saw the misery of his people. He heard their cries of suffering, those, those moments where they cried out, it's not fair. And now for the 10th plague, the role has been reversed. The Egyptians are the ones who I'm, I'm, I'm guessing have been left weeping and wailing, crying out, it's not fair. Let's make this a little close to home. I can't help but think that you've had traumatic moments in your own life where you've been struck down. Maybe you've not been struck down physically, literally, but but what about those moments that take the wind out of your sails? Your wife, after 20 years of marriage, walks out on you and the kids. You've been let go of your job. You just got the diagnosis. You lost the baby. You're awakened at two in the morning. Your daughter's been in a car accident. See, moments, traumatic moments that you've been through that are too heavy to stomach. Situations that seem too much to handle, too difficult to bear. Figuratively speaking, life has thrown that one-two punch and we've face-planted on the ground. And the referee begins to count. We've been struck down. That's the reality. (laughs) But the hope. You know, at this moment in time, you might be thinking, you might say to yourself, "It, it wasn't supposed to be this way. This is not what I had planned. I mean, shock and awe are just two emotions that you may be feeling when traumatic moments occur. The the reality that Paul gives here, every single person has experienced in some form or another. Hard pressed, perplexed, persecuted, and now struck down. I mean, it can't get much worse, can it? I've heard people say it's going to get worse before it gets better. But let's just think about that logic for a moment. If it's the worst, how can it get more worse? worse. I mean, at what point in time do we say, here comes the better? (laughs) Where in the traumatic moment do we look for the relief? Do we sense and feel that the worst is behind us? And so Paul gives us one last hope. He says, struck down, but not destroyed. In essence, the worst, worst, worst case scenario for this life and traumatic moments that he's talking about is ruin. It's physical death. In fact, Paul goes on to say in verse 10, we always carry around the We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. If you think about it, many, many, many people fear death. 
In psychology, it's called death anxiety. Emily Dickinson wrote, all but death can be adjusted. Someone once said, death is a powerful motivator for human behavior. Hence the reason why Paul followed this up by saying, therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. What's he saying here? We may be struck down. Outwardly we are wasting away, people. But we are not destroyed. We are being renewed day by day because of the hope that we find in Jesus Christ. You know, there's one thing that I've always needed to have. It never fails, whether it comes from a sense of wanting to be right or thinking I'm right or or just wanting the final say, I have to have the last word. (laughs) What about you? The last impression sometimes to me seems more important than the first impression. But the Lord impressed upon my heart that a lot of times this stems from pride. The sin of pride, not humility. In those moments, I I seek forgiveness from the Lord. But, But think just for a moment about what Jesus could have done. Has it ever dawned on you that Jesus knowingly and voluntarily took up upon himself the pain, the torture, the suffering for us all? When he could have even actually done something about it. You know, let's just recount the moments of when Jesus was struck down. In Matthew 26, Jesus is before the Sanhedrin, and in verse 66 through 68, it says this, What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Others slapped him and said, Prophesy to us, Christ, who hit you. Matthew 27, Jesus is among the soldiers in the praetorium. Verse 28 through 30 says this, They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. Verse 39 says, those, as he's hanging on the cross, it says that those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads. I mean, Jesus endured all of this. I mean, he was struck down many times. But what's interesting is that when, it, when they came to arrest Jesus, the disciples wanted to defend him and fight for him. One even cut off the ear of Malchus, the servant of the high priest. And and yet Jesus says, put your sword back in its place. For all who draw the sword die by the sword. And then this is what he says. I, I love this part. Do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Wow. See, Jesus didn't need to have the last word. Through obedience and humility, he spoke through his death and resurrection. He was struck down, but not destroyed. Hallelujah. You know, near the end of Paul's second letter, the one we've been looking at, He mentions a thorn in his flesh. And to sum up these last four weeks with the phrases he used to encourage and challenge God's people, I want to leave you with this. He says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest 
on me. Wow. Now that's my prayer as we finish this series. That we will boast all the more in our weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest upon us to the glory of his name and to the advancement of his kingdom. Amen. pray that this week you will be reminded of what God said to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Amen. Go in that grace.